always dressed to kill. Alfred Hitchcock's fashion secrets revealed. Tonight on Hollywood Fashion Machine. Alfred Hitchcock planned his films down to the smallest detail, as carefully as a Hitchcock villain plotting the perfect crime. But nowhere was he more brilliantly devious than when dressing his greatest cinematic creation, the mysterious heroine known as the Hitchcock Blonde. Like no director before or since, Hitchcock clothed, coiffed, and accessorized his actresses not only with a reverence for beauty and maniacal attention to detail, but toward weaving their fashions into the very fabric of his plots. When we think of Alfred Hitchcock, we think of haunting mystery and lasting images of primal terror. But perhaps the most powerful Hitchcock image is not one of horror, but of breathtaking beauty. The Hitchcock Woman of Intrigue, an image brought unforgettably to life by stunning actresses like Grace Kelly, Kim Novak, Janet Lee, and Tippi Hedren, all wearing fashions meticulously chosen by the great director himself. I uh, can't think offhand of a director that used uh, fashion um, to his advantage to complete his image that he wanted to present um, more effectively than Mr. Hitchcock. I think what it reflects is the completeness of how he had the picture shot in his mind before it ever started. And I think that the fashion correctness as an addition, sort of fulfilling one part of his pie. In a rare recently discovered interview, his favorite designer, Edith Head, maintained that Hitchcock paid more attention to fashion than any other director in history. Hitchcock is the only person who writes a script to such detail that you really could go ahead and almost make the clothes uh, without discussing because it's so completely lucid, like she's in a black coat and she has a black hat and she wears black glasses. A lot of uh, things give no clues at all. By the 1950s, movie screens blazed with the seething sexuality of actresses like Marilyn Monroe and Ava Gardner. But Alfred Hitchcock flew in the face of 50s conventions. His ideal woman was impeccably tasteful, elegantly subtle, and sexually mysterious. I'm not interested in showing the Marilyn Monroe type. You know, because you've said sex. You said it, and uh, you never left the audience to discover it. And you're fine in England or Scandinavia, the girls looking very, very much like schoolmistresses. But if they got in a taxi with you, all sex would break loose. This Hitchcock ideal, proper on the outside, a volcano within, harkened back to the untouchable glamour of Hollywood's golden age, and even further to the prim era of Hitchcock's youth, exemplified by his mother, Emma, and her impeccable wardrobe. Hitchcock was a Victorian. I mean, he, his mother was a figure of the late Victorian era. His views of his parents and of women were formed in the latter part of the 19th century. And he would parrot those views all his life. In 1953, Hitchcock attended a preview screening of Mogambo and found himself mesmerized by its young ingenue, Grace Kelly. A bona fide member of Philadelphia's upper crust, Kelly embodied Hitchcock's high Victorian ideal of a cool, refined beauty, behind whose impeccable fashions lay deep wells of smoldering desire. She would be the first and the greatest Hitchcock blonde. She was the perfect female protagonist for Hitchcock, well, perfect. If he drew what he wanted, he would draw her. She was also incredible to dress. She was, in many ways, the most costumable woman in film history. Hitchcock quickly cast Kelly in his thriller, Dial M for Murder, and was so impressed by her natural elegance that he tailor-made a role for her in his next film, Rear Window. 
here, Kelly blooms into mesmerizing beauty, and her wardrobe not only takes center stage, but becomes central to the plot. Legendary designer Edith Head brought the master's ideas to the screen in dazzling detail. Albert Hitchcock and Edith Head were a match made in heaven. He put his fantasies up on the screen, and Edith Head was able to deliver that fantasy in terms of the fashion, in terms of the style, in terms of making women absolutely the best and the most glamorous and the most sensual that they could be. In Rear Window, Kelly's glamorous Edith Head clothes actually create the main conflict between her high society character and her down-to-earth, no-nonsense boyfriend, James Stewart. Is this the Lisa Fremont who never wears the same dress twice? Only because it's expected of her. From her very first entrance into Stewart's cramped bachelor apartment, Kelly overwhelms him with her stunning gown. Grace Kelly was never better than when she sailed into the opening scenes of Rear Window in that gorgeous, airy dress. She's like an apparition, bringing with her all of the beauty of female sexuality. Edith had described this legendary black and white gown as one of Hitchcock's shock dresses so named for its effect on the audience, not to mention the powerful Technicolor company. In those days, generally, the majority of pictures were still being made in black and white. So when pictures were in color, the Technicolor company and the studios generally wanted a lot of color on the screen. To do a black and white outfit in a color movie was, was quite a shocking idea. Edith had later explained that Hitchcock instructed her to make Kelly seem untouchable like a piece of Dresden china. With Hitchcock's heroines, looks are deceptive, and this delicate piece of china turns out to be as tough as nails. In fact, she ends up using her knowledge of fashion to solve the film's central mystery. James Stewart is convinced that neighbor Raymond Burr has murdered his wife, but Stewart can't get anyone to believe him. Once again, fashion and its accessories step into the spotlight, providing the clue that solves the crime. Grace Kelly and James Stewart are think Raymond Burr killed his wife, and you know they're they're trying to prove it. And they see him going through her handbag, and he pulls out pearls and a wedding ring. And you solve the plot through the jewelry because Grace Kelly tells you that no woman would ever have her jewelry all tangled up in a purse. Women don't keep their jewelry in a purse, getting all twisted and scratched and tangled up. And that becomes incredibly appealing to James Stewart, which is fabulous. In their final film together, To Catch a Thief, the plot again revolves around fashion. This time, the stylish paradox of beautiful women not being what they seem. Costuming takes, uh, again, a primary role in the film. The film is about costuming. It is about the roles we play and how we costume ourselves. Kelly plays an heiress whose passionate personality is at first obscured by her dazzling, chilly glamour. She begins by feigning indifference to debonair jewel thief Cary Grant. And for this entrance, Hitchcock instructed Edith Head to make Kelly look cool, confident, and aloof. She wanted to show Grace Kelly's sort of cool, glacial qualities. So the first time you see her in an evening dress, it's, it's blue chiffon. It's two or three shades of blue chiffon. And it has tiny little spaghetti straps holding up the bodice. And of course, this shows Grace Kelly's gorgeous shoulders. And it's just as beautiful as anything could possibly be. But Kelly surprises Grant and shocks the audience when she suddenly reveals the sensuous woman beneath the icy fashion facade. He said, well, you know, he says, Kelly in that picture, she really plays a typical English woman, very cool on the outside very unruffled and the first to go for the fly that's epitomized in that scene at the door when she says good night to Cary Grant and kisses him out of the blue it's as though she unzipped his fly you see in scene after scene Hitchcock uses clothes and especially jewelry as metaphors for sexual attraction Cary Grant can barely tell what excites him more, Grace Kelly's surprising sexual forwardness or her dazzling jewels. All he can see are these jewels, both valuable and erotic to him. The subject of a scene could be the jewels, and the subtext known to everyone was sex. Look, John, hold them. 
diamond. The only thing in the world you can't resist. For this scene, Hitchcock chose a dress that made both Grace Kelly and the jewels look as irresistible as possible. She's wearing a white chiffon evening gown. He wanted it strapless, so there would be nothing around that fabulous necklace that she was wearing. Just the necklace and her beautiful tanned skin. As the tension builds between the heiress and the thief, Kelly's clothes become brighter and brighter until she finally explodes across the screen in a solid gold ball gown. After only three films, Hitchcock's partnership with Grace Kelly ended when she quit Hollywood to wed the Prince of Monaco whom she had met while filming To Catch a Thief in Monte Carlo. Hitchcock was crushed by the loss of the actress he considered his muse. I think Hitchcock would have been happy to cast Grace Kelly for the rest of his life to build pictures around her. As Princess Grace sailed off on her honeymoon cruise in an Edith Head designed dress, a bereft Alfred Hitchcock lost the ultimate embodiment of his dream woman. Now, he was seized with a desire to recreate her. When we return, Hollywood's greatest director becomes its most notorious Svengali, as one Hollywood actress after another tries out for the ultimate Hitchcock role, the Hitchcock blonde. Sometimes for better, sometimes decidedly for worse. Grace Kelly lingered in Hitchcock's imagination as the prototype for his future leading ladies. Paradoxes of impeccable aloofness and smoldering sexuality who would come to be known as the Hitchcock Blondes. Hitchcock chose Kim Novak, one of Hollywood's loveliest blondes, to star in Vertigo, a dark tale of treachery and obsession. In Alfred Hitchcock's masterpiece, Vertigo, Costuming plays an extraordinarily important role. In fact, it is in many ways sort of the theme of the film. For the first of her dual roles in the film, Novak plays the mysterious and wealthy Madeline Elster. Though Novak was a classic 50s sex symbol, Hitchcock dressed her not in a tight, form-fitting outfit, but a severe gray-tailored suit. A shocking choice for Novak, and almost unthinkable for any other director in the 50s, it nonetheless became an instant Hitchcock classic. And you would think a gray suit is kind of a drab thing for this kind of fantasy woman to wear, but Hitchcock wanted her to look like she'd come out of the San Francisco fog. So it was all about gray. Everything Madeline wears has a special symbolism beyond mere fashion. Even her hairstyle is a subtle play on the title and theme of the film. When you look at Kim Novak from the back, her hair is very tightly coiled. It's a spiral. It's incredible. Hitchcock shoots her hair from the back a lot. You could get vertigo looking at the chignon. Scotty falls desperately in love with the mysterious Madeline, but loses her when she leaps to her death from a bell tower. Later, he stumbles upon Judy, a cheap shop girl who looks remarkably like Madeline. Jimmy Stewart begins to transform Judy into the Madeline that he, he longs for. He takes her to Ransomhoff's, a very fashionable dress shop in San Francisco and begins to shop for gray dresses to make her look like Madeline. Vertigo has so much to do with Hitchcock himself and the idea of creating a fantasy woman. Every time he saw a starlet that interested him, it would be like, let's bleach the hair, let's do this outfit. And it was always to emulate Grace Kelly. It was always platinum, soft rolled hair or pinned back, very pale makeup. Well, I'll wear the darn clothes if you want me to, if, if you'll just just like me. Color of your hair. Oh, no. Judy, please, it can't matter to you. At the film's critical turning point, Scotty finally makes the deadly discovery that Judy and Madeline are the same person. And in true Hitchcockian style, fashion provides the vital clue to the deception. In this case, it's Judy's ornate necklace, a necklace formerly worn by Madeline. When you see that moment, you see jewelry, a part of costuming, becoming a star of the film. You see it in the picture, then you see it on Kim Novak with that black dress. 
that absolutely frames it again. This is where Edith Head and Alfred Hitchcock, they're working together, and it just frames so beautifully the piece of jewellery, which gives the whole story away. And I can't think of another director that used jewellery to that extent to solve a story, to seduce a man, and to move a plot along. In this house, the most dire, horrible events took place. For Psycho, Hitchcock departed completely from his usual glamorous and mysterious blonde. Janet Lee's character, Marion Crane, is an ordinary woman in ordinary clothes. But Hitchcock paid as much attention to her humble wardrobe as he did to Grace Kelly's lavish gowns. He wanted Marion to be real. There were no custom clothes. It was all off the rack because that's what Marion Crane could have afforded. Hitchcock went to almost obsessive lengths to depict Marion's life as a secretary in a Phoenix real estate office. He went to Arizona and photographed uh, a real estate office with the real uh, people in it and uh, they went home with them and photographed their closets and their clothing and then he showed us the stills and that was uh, the way he said, I want my principles to look. In the opening scene, Marion and her lover, played by John Gavin, are enjoying an afternoon tryst. You see Janet Leigh in her underwear, that is white, the white bra and the white slip. Hitchcock wants you to feel that she's an innocent, she's pure. But later, she steals $40,000 from her office. Hitchcock then employs a clever piece of fashion symbolism by dressing her in a black bra. And I thought it was daring on the part of uh, Hitchcock to do that and I like the obviousness of it go from white to black because now she's she's on her way to her destruction there was a sensualness that he wanted because without the passion from Marion Crane you wouldn't understand why she took such a drastic step by now Hitchcock's fashion genius had set a gold standard for modern films and become an inspiration for directors everywhere. Sadly though he had never found a replacement for his ultimate muse Grace Kelly. Now the man who could remake Hollywood's biggest stars would create a new star out of his own fevered imagination and then tear her to shreds. After years of working with Hollywood's greatest leading ladies, Alfred Hitchcock found his final fashion icon, not in an Oscar-winning film or a Broadway play, but a diet soda commercial. Tippi Hedren was a model, not an actress, but the Svengali director was determined to craft her into his most original creation. He didn't realize it at the time, but she would be the last of the Hitchcock blondes. A surprised Hedron was signed to a seven-year contract and was then subjected to perhaps the longest, most grueling screen test in Hollywood history. Call her, Marty. T-14, take one. I'm sending over to you a high priestess. Now, don't, don't turn the body to How would you suggest I do this? What have you got in your mouth? My tongue. It took uh, three days to do this screen test. And we did scenes from Rebecca, Catch a Thief, and Notorious. Those are three entirely different women. And um, so the clothes had to be very, very different for each one. And uh, Edith oversaw that whole epic. I think this has ruined me forever. Hitchcock was no longer merely costuming his actress. Tippi Hedren herself became the medium, the image, the icon meant to equal even Grace Kelly. I was really groomed uh, from, you know, from the very beginning. He wasn't only my director, he was my drama coach. He kept absolute, total care of how I was presented because first impressions are very, very important. Incredibly, this process would turn Hedron into a major star and a household name on the basis of a mere two films. But what films? For their first collaboration, Hitchcock cast her as Melanie Daniels, the heroine of his chilling masterpiece, The Birds. 
Most directors in 1963 would have dressed her San Francisco character in casual sportswear, but most directors were not Alfred Hitchcock. Melanie Daniels arrives in her magnificent chariot of a blue sports car with her fur coat uh, and her glamorous high heels and, and uh, dress and exquisite uh, scarf. She sails into this town, literally a wave of her magnetism that comes from her natural elegance, from the exquisite uh, clothing that she's wearing, and from her sense of command. But Melanie's seemingly out of place formality makes perfect sense as the terrifying film progresses. Eventually, her immaculate suit has been pecked to shreds by the birds, a symbol of her own shattered emotional state. The official starters are director Alfred Hitchcock and Tippi Hedren, who is being... Finally, the film was done, but not the makeover. Hitchcock obsessively maintained control of Hedren throughout the long publicity campaign. He was quoted saying, I controlled every movement on her face. She wasn't allowed to do anything beyond what I gave her. It was my control entirely. It was a control that would ultimately destroy their close relationship. Their next and final collaboration was Marnie, in which all of Hitchcock's fashion genius comes into play. The creation of the icy blonde, the use of fashion to advance and define the plot, and its use to cover up who we really are, as Marnie transforms herself from raven-haired beauty to stunning blonde horsewoman to mousy secretary. But during production, life began to imitate art with tragic consequences. Hedren resented Hitchcock's constant attempts to control her, and she finally lashed out, making reference to his obesity. For the Victorian director, it was an unspeakable lapse. By the end of the film, it was the sort of thing, please tell Miss Hedren to take a step toward uh, the console, and uh, please tell Mr. Hitchcock that I feel uncomfortable uh, sitting in that chair. They were talking through intermediaries, so it had, uh, the relationship had fallen completely apart. As Hitchcock's relationship with Tippi Hedren disintegrated, so too did his vision of the classic Hitchcock blonde. The year was 1964, and Hitchcock knew that the golden age of Hollywood was over for good, along with its high-gloss glamour and classic elegance. I think it was a big turning point for Hitchcock. He began talking in interviews for the first time about never seeing big stars in his film again, casting people who were more documentary-looking as opposed to fantastic-looking. Uh, Hitchcock never made another high-fashion film and abandoned his quest to create his feminine icon. But the genius of his greatest work reverberates in the fashion world even today. What he did in fashion and movies had a pronounced influence, not only fashion movies today, but fashion. Carl Lagerfeld could sit at home, pop that movie in the video, and the next day the collection looks like that. And you do see lots of these looks turning up year after year. And they, people refer to it, you know, oh, this is Hitchcock Rear Window, this is Vertigo. Definitely. Why the Hitchcock blonde held such fascination for him remains a mystery. The master most certainly would have wanted it that way. Mr. Hitchcock was a great showman. He was also a bit of an imp. He would love to put people on. You once told me that actors were cattle to be shoved about. I wonder if you care to enlarge on that. You mean you want to make them larger cattle than they are? He, I'm sure, nurtured that rumor or that sort of image, the Hitchcock blondes. He would love that. That would just be something he would adore. Perish the thought, but if you could only make one more picture, what would it be about? I think it would be about murder, mayhem, violence, sex, beautifully pictorially expressed, lovely costumes, perfect cutting, and uh, a joke or two. With a Hitchcock blonde as his inspiration, Alfred Hitchcock moved fashion into the cinematic spotlight in ways that had never been equaled, leaving behind a legacy that will inspire imitators for as long as films are made. A legacy of bewitching beauty, sensational style, and spellbinding mystery. <laughs>